Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to talk about what I've called a Christian first aid kit, and this is a condensed or abbreviated teaching from John 14, 15, and 16. About 25 or 30 years ago, I taught a series that was 16 teachings from John 14, 15, and 16. Now I've uh, condensed it into a six-part series, and I'm calling it the Christian First Aid Kit. We started talking about that from John 14, 15, and 16. Last week, I covered John 14, 1. I spent five days on one verse. This week, I've been talking from John 14, 2 and 3, where Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And the reason I believe that he started directing their attention towards heaven and the promises and the provision that God has made for us in heaven is because he had told them not to let their heart be troubled, and yet they were about to enter into this terrible time where they saw Jesus crucified, buried. It looked like he had lost, like he had failed. And until he was resurrected from the dead, there really wasn't anything positive in their life. How do you let not your heart be troubled in a situation like that? Well, if nothing else, just look at the future. Look at heaven. Look at the promises. If you can't see anything positive in your present uh, situation, which Again, I want to clarify this, that I think most people just amplify the negative. The truth is there's something positive in any person's situation. I, I believe there's very few people that are in just, I mean, totally desperate situations. The average person just focuses on the negative. There could be 99 things right and one thing wrong, and the average person will sit there and be depressed over that one thing. This is the reason that when... You're having problems in your life. If you go and minister to someone who's worse than you, all of a sudden you feel better. Because you know what it does? It reminds you that, man, it could be worse. I, at least, you know, I've heard people say that uh, they complained about their feet hurting until they meant the man who had no feet. And then all of a sudden, praise God, I've got feet that are hurting. Amen. And it just changes your perspective. This is what Jesus was doing. He was talking about that if you really are in a crisis situation and if there is nothing good, then just think about the promises about eternity, heaven, how God has made provision for us. And if nothing else, we could rejoice in that and we could find comfort and something to build us up in that situation just thinking about heaven. So that's what we've been talking about. I've also been taking this from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. And Paul said, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment. See, this is exactly what Jesus was doing in John 14, where he said, Don't let your heart be troubled, and then think about in my Father's house are many mansions. He was putting it into perspective. And this is what Paul said, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment. This isn't saying that his affliction only lasted one hour. You can go to the Word of God and find that he, he said that, uh, matter of fact, right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, it seems like that we, the apostles, are appointed unto death. He says, you are blessed. The people we ministered to, you are blessed and promoted and God begins to prosper you, but the ones who brought this truth to you, we're just constantly being rejected. He says, we are of all men most miserable. It just seems like people are constantly against us. So Paul is not saying that he only had a problem for a 10 minutes or the longest problem he had ever had lasted an hour. He was referring to this entire life down here and all of the troubles that come in this life and the persecution for being an apostle. He says it's just like a moment. He was putting it into the perspective of eternity. So again, he said, our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. And again, he's talking about in heaven. There were going to be rewards. So see, he balanced all of the problems, all of the things. He was stoned and left for dead. He was imprisoned. He was beaten with rods. He was beaten with whips. But all of those things he put into perspective and realized that the more he suffered, the more rewards that he would get in eternity. And because of that, Paul just said, it's just a light affliction. He even said, 
over in 2 Corinthians 11. He got to a place that he gloried in his infirmities, but then in Philippians chapter 3, he longed to know Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings. Not that he enjoyed suffering, but he knew that every time he suffered for the cause of Christ, there was going to be a great reward, uh, and the compensation would be more than all of the suffering that he endured. And because he was not just thinking in terms of this life, but he was thinking about eternity and how that he would be blessed forever for the things that he suffered. Because of that, see, it was able to shrink these problems down. And he looked at his problems differently than most people did. He didn't magnify the problem. He magnified the promise about how he would be compensated and rewarded for it. And because of that, he was able to not let his heart be troubled. Boy, that is powerful. That's what I've been talking about for the last two days. And then in verse 18, he says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So Paul here said he had just a light affliction, not because he had less problems than we do. He had more problems, more hardships, but it affected him less because of the way he processed it. The first thing he mentions is he put it into perspective and looked at it in the light of eternity. The second thing he says, he says, we are looking at things that can't be seen. You know, this really throws some people off because if you can't see it, then how can you look at it? And I've got an entire series that came out of this entitled Faith Builders. And I've got a, I've got a number of different teachings on this. But uh, basically, this is what faith enables us to do. You have not only five senses, you've got six senses. You can see with your heart. You can see things by faith that you can't see with your physical eyes. And see, this, again, fits perfectly with the point that Jesus was making. Don't let your heart be troubled. How is it that you could do that? Through faith, you believe in God, believe also in me. And this is what Paul is saying. He first of all put his problems into the light of eternity. It's just for a moment. And then he says, I'm not looking with just my physical eyes. I'm looking with my heart. I'm seeing things that you can't see with your physical eyes. You know, there's some people that think that what I'm talking about walking by faith is foolish. But, you know, I honestly, and I don't mean this in a bad way, I'm just trying to say I recommend walking by faith. I actually pity people that all you can do is see with your physical eyes. You can't see beyond what is right in front of you. You can't see by faith. I know that some of you right now, it's just like, man, this is weird. I believe that you're weird. I mean that in a positive way. But God created us to be able to see things on the inside that you can't just see with your physical eyes. No person is as blind as the person who can only see with your eyes. God made it so that you can know things in your heart, so that you can see things. You know, this building that I'm in right now, God gave this to us, and it was a warehouse. It was empty. And I had to see this thing. I designed it. I built it. I didn't physically build it, but I made the design, turned it over to other people. They built it. We put tape on the floor, and I spent a, a year probably walking this place and praying over it and seeing this building finish out and seeing the money to be able to do it. And I tell you, it was as real to me as, as it is right now. Matter of fact, when we had the opening service in this building, and people were just shouting and praising God because it looked impossible to get this done debt-free the way I decided to do. There was a lot of people that weren't sure it would ever come to pass. And when we physically saw it and we had the opening service in this building, people were shouting and screaming and praising God, and I was just like I am right now. And I had some students come up to me and say, aren't you excited? Man, doesn't it do something to you to see this? And I said, I've been excited over this for a year. I, I've been walking this building at night when nobody else is here, and I've been praying, and I've seen this already. I said, what you're seeing with your physical eyes, I've already seen on the inside. And seeing it with my eyes isn't as real to me as when I saw it in my heart. You can see by faith, and that's what Paul is talking about. This is how he was able to just say, it's just a light affliction. Because he saw things that other people didn't see. He was looking at the rewards in heaven. He was seeing the Lord honor him. 
and bless him. You know, a similar uh, situation here is when um, Stephen was stoned to death in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. He was the first Christian martyr. And Stephen gave a testimony for the Lord. The people rose up and they stoned him to death. And as Stephen was being stoned to death, he said that he saw the heavens open and Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. Did you know that every place in Scripture, like Hebrews chapter 10, there's other places that talk about Jesus is seated at the Father's right hand. But Stephen saw him standing. I personally, this is andeology, I believe that Jesus stood to acknowledge and to honor the first martyr, that he was honoring him. He was recognizing him. And because of this, Stephen was being stoned to death, and yet he was able to just have love flow out of him and say, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. You know why? Because he was seeing things that other people couldn't see. In the Spirit, he saw Jesus stand to honor him at the Father's right hand. He was being so supernaturally supplied through the Spirit that the things of this world just became nearly insignificant. I know that in the natural, he was suffering pain. He was stoned to death. But in the spirit, his spirit was so strong that it just shrunk that stoning, being stoned to death down to where he was experiencing love and acceptance from God. Again, those of you who only see with your physical eyes and you can't see with your heart, you're going to think that what I'm saying is strange. But this is what God has made available to us. And to a degree, I've experienced this. When I first got really turned on to the Lord, I just fell so in love with the Lord in 1968. I mean, it just captivated me. And right after that, I was drafted in 1969. 1970, January of 70, I went to Vietnam, and I was still just overwhelmed with the love of God. And I literally was in situations. I, I wasn't aware of it at the time because I was just so focused on God. It was like the physical world. And all of the hardships I was experiencing in Vietnam, it just, it didn't really affect me. It was like water off a duck's back. But 20 years after I got back from Vietnam, I was in Chicago and a man handed me a book that had, uh, I think it was 12 testimonies of Vietnam vets and the terrible trauma that they went through, how bad it was. And then they encountered the Lord and God set them free. And it was really a good book. And he was one of the people in there he gave me this book, signed it, and I knew he was going to ask me the next night if I'd read it. So when I got to my hotel room, I read his story, and it was really powerful. So I read another story, and I wound up staying all night, up all night long reading that book. And there was three people in that book that were there the exact same time that I was there. Two of them were in the same division that I was in. And as I read one of their testimonies, you know, I'm not sure that this is exactly what I went through, but I think that it was, I think I was there when this guy was describing it. It was the same time, the same division. It was on a forward fire support base that they just had temporarily set up. I was a chaplain's assistant. I went out with the chaplain. Uh, he was a Protestant chaplain, but it was the Protestant equivalent of reading the last rites to these guys because their position was going to, for all probability, be overrun. And so this chaplain went out to try and encourage the soldiers right before they faced death. And while we were there, we were only there about five hours, and we were in an area that was not very big at all, just a few hundred feet. And inside of that perimeter while we were there, we took 170-something mortar hits inside our perimeter. We were in bunkers and under these... Uh, Quonset hut type things and hiding. And I mean, you could hear the gunfire. I actually had my weapon pointed down the hill and I could see the muzzle fire of the Vietnamese as they came up the hill attacking us. And uh, I didn't ever fire because they were so far away it would have been wasted. But it was that close. And we were being bombarded. And, you know, this is during a time that I was just so in love with the Lord and so excited. I was exactly like what Paul was talking about, where he said, I have a desire to depart for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. And I was so excited about the Lord that I had been praying for months that God would just kill me and take me home because I figured that's the best way I could experience God was just to get out of this body and be in eternity. And... Um, 
I had been praying that way, and when it looked like we were going to be overrun, I remember with my M16 pointed down the hill, I remember what I was thinking, and I was praying and saying, Oh, God, I know where I'm going. Today could be the day that I get to meet you face to face. Today could be the answer to my prayer. And I was excited. I was praising God. And I was interceding for the Vietnamese because I knew where I was going, but I didn't know where they were going, and there was going to be a lot of people die that day. And I remember just feeling love and compassion flow out of me in this terrible situation. And then because I was a chaplain's assistant, they wouldn't allow the chaplain to be there when it was overrun, so they brought in a chopper. We left, and that place was overrun, and all but just a couple of guys died. And uh, anyway, I was reading about this 20 years after the fact in the book. And through the book, the person who wrote the book wasn't a believer when this happened. And he wasn't talking about feeling the love of God and the compassion of God flow through him towards the Vietnamese. Instead, he was talking about the fear that struck him. He was describing the situation. He was talking about the smells. I remember all of the smells of all this gunpowder. You could smell the Vietnamese coming. They ate so much fish that you could actually smell them before they got close and stuff. And I remember all of these smells, all of these sensations, and I mean all of a sudden, it's like God transported me back to that thing 20 years before and let me see it through the eyes of a person that was only seeing with their eyes and feeling with their five senses. They weren't walking in faith. And all of a sudden, fear hit me. And I, it took me a day or two to pray the fear off of me from a situation that happened 20 years before that I lived through with flying colors. I had no fear. Matter of fact, I'd never even mentioned this experience to anybody because it was just another day in Vietnam. I was in a number of situations like that. It didn't even register to me. I never had told anybody about it. It was just, it wasn't that big of a deal. And yet, when I saw it through the eyes of an unbeliever, it's like God, 20 years later, showed me how I was just living in a bubble. And because my mind was stayed on him, because I had uh, a relative uh, value on my life here, I, I related it to eternity, and I recognized that the time here on the earth isn't that big of a deal. And if I died, so what? I go to be with the Lord. Because of all of these things that I've been talking about for nearly two weeks, it just shrunk my problem, this crisis situation, down to where it wasn't a big deal. It was no big deal. I saw it through the eyes of another person that didn't have that perspective, and all of a sudden, the physical, carnal, natural reality just nearly overwhelmed me, and it took faith for me to get my faith back, uh, my feelings and emotions back online. But I'm using this to describe that, you know what, it's exactly like the Apostle Paul said, that you can get to where you put things in the light of eternity that minimizes your problems, it brings them down to a manageable size, and then you can see with your heart. You can see things by faith. You don't have to be bound to just your five senses. You don't have to just be listening to what the news has to say about what's going to happen in this nation, about what the banker has to say, what the doctor has to say about you, what your mate has to say about you, what the people at work have to say. You don't have to be limited to all of these things. You can get into faith. You can begin to start seeing with your heart. You can get in the presence of God and hear a word from God. And God can speak things to you that allow you to walk right through the midst of a situation. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were in a situation where they were commanded to bow down to an idol or you are going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And they said, oh, Lord, uh, they were talking to the king, Nebuchadnezzar. They said, oh, king says, we aren't careful to answer you in this situation. That means that they weren't worried about what he could do to them. They didn't have any worry or care about it. They said, our God who we serve is able to deliver us, but let it be known unto you that if he doesn't deliver us, we still aren't going to serve you. Most people couldn't act like that. But see, they had a different perspective. They were seeing things that other people couldn't see. They had a relationship with God. They knew that if this physical body was to be destroyed, it didn't matter. They had another body prepared for them in eternity. They were going to live forever in eternity. And they had a different perspective. And because of it, the king got so mad, he heated the furnace seven times hotter than normal, commanded his mightiest men to be wrapped in coat, 
and things to protect them, and even the mighty men of war, they were all killed just trying to throw the three Hebrew children into the furnace. And yet when they were thrown in there, the king looked down and he saw not just three men, but four men, and said that the fourth one was like the Son of God. Meshach, Shadnach, and Abednego were in the midst of this huge furnace that killed the people who even got close to it. They were loose. Their bands were gone. They were talking to Jesus, walking with Jesus in the midst of this fire. And, they, and finally, the king had them brought out. They walked right out. There wasn't any burns on them. There wasn't even a smell of smoke. Some people think, I just can't believe that. Well, then you just can't believe the Word of God. That is exactly what the Scriptures teach over in the book of Daniel. I believe it's chapter 3. And this is what happened. And you know what? You can walk right through the midst of your problem. You can be supernatural. It can happen. I know that some of you are thinking, I just don't understand this. As I continue on, I'm going to give you some, some how-tos. How do we get this supernatural power working in us? But you know, the very first thing is, most people don't even believe that this is possible. Most people are living like a mere man or woman. You aren't drawing on any supernatural power. You aren't expecting anything supernatural. You're getting exactly what you're believing for. There are many of you that don't believe God can heal you, and so guess what? You aren't healed. You don't believe that God can intervene in a marriage as bad as yours, so guess what? It's not being set free. Until you, first of all, change your desire, until you start raising your sight and shooting at something bigger than what you've been aiming at, you're never going to see things change. So the very first step is you've got to have this new hope. You've got to recognize that God has more for you than what most of you are living in. Man, most people are shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. You need to increase. And if you shoot at the stars, and even if you don't make it, if you hit the moon, that's more than what you ever would have done before. You need to start believing for something big. You need to start seeing things that can't be seen. And this is what the apostle Paul talked about in the next chapter. And, and remember that men are the ones that put the chapter and verse divisions in here. In the next chapter, he begins to amplify on this, talking about that this physical body is going to be destroyed. But we have a new body that is reserved for us. Now, where did he get that from? There isn't any physical proof of that. Nobody can sit there and convince you, uh, you know, in just empirical facts, some kind of physical truth, so, something that you can test in a test tube, that there is a part of you that lives on after death and that you get a new body. This isn't anything tangible that produces this. It's faith in the Word of God. And Paul says we have... He's now listing this confidence belief that he had another body waiting as an example of seeing things that cannot be seen. You know, I'm out of time right here, but I'll come back to this tomorrow, and we'll teach on this, and I think that there's some really powerful things that could help you. Remember that I have a brand new teaching on this entitled the Christian First Aid Kit. I also have our classic teaching on this that I did like 30 years ago entitled the Christian Survival Kit. If you'll listen, our announcer will give you information, and please call or write today. Today's complete teaching titled, Christian First Aid Kit, was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. This series has over six hours of teaching and is available on either audio CD or DVD. Each is available for 19 pounds. This teaching is also available on DVD as seen on our daily TV program. You can receive it for 19 pounds when you contact us. Or you can get the Christian First Aid Kit as part of the Survival Kit package. In addition to Christian First Aid Kit, this package also includes the Christian Survival Kit, a 16-part series. Together, these two series provide 22 hours of teaching. The entire package has a catalog value of 55 pounds. But today you can get the survival kit package for just 50 pounds when you order. The second audio teaching in today's series is available for three pounds when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this second CD titled Christian First Aid Kit Part Two free of charge. 
We'd like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled Effortless Change for £8.50. Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We hope to hear from you today. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis more than 20 years ago. I had control of nothing. My arms, my legs, I had no control. Each day I felt like I could wake up and my mom would be gone. It was really hard for me. I began to feel uh, helpless. The frustration of not being able to fix something when you're a fix-it guy. Andrew put it so clearly. That's what freed me. The more I applied the word, then the healing, healing will come, the healing will come, just gradually, gradually. And that was okay for me because I knew that I was healed. For more information on this and other stories, visit awmi.net. Click on Ministry News and discover what's happening at Andrew Womack Ministries. I had been looking for the more in my life and someone had given me a teaching tape of Andrew's and um, had shared another church with me who is also a Karis Bible College uh, affiliate up in Fort Collins. Um, so I began to listen to Andrew's tapes and seeing that Andrew had the more, was teaching the more that Jesus said we would be doing the greater, raising the dead, healing the sick, opening blind eyes. So I began to listen to Andrew's tapes and then I was diagnosed with cancer. So I got every tape that I could and it was just feeding my belief and starving my unbelief with the Word of God, with Andrew's teachings. I emailed Andrew. He prayed for me just a simple prayer, um, commanding the cancer to leave my body. I went in for the surgery. Um, I was probably about a week and a half, two weeks later. Uh, the doctors called me the very next day, which is unusual, and said, Connie, we don't know what happened. All the cancer was gone. Um, of course, my husband and I rejoiced, and I said, I know what happened. <laughs> cancer was the big sickness that came upon me, but not bigger than a cold for me anymore.